What's up, Lions of Liberty fans? You can now support this show on Patreon and get exclusive access to bonus audio and video content, including Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, bonus segments with guests, and so much more. Head on over to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another episode of Felony Friday, a weekly show right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Of course, Felony Friday is the only show... I think so. I think the only show that focuses every single episode on exposing injustice in this nation's broken criminal justice system. Felony Friday, although is only one of three shows that we have here on Lions of Liberty. We kick off every week with our Monday show hosted by Mark Clare. It is our longest running program. It is our flagship program. Mark interviews leaders in the liberty movement, delving into politics and philosophy and leadership. It's a fantastic show. Check it out. Every Wednesday, we have Electric Liberty Land hosted by Brian McWilliams. It is your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty. You can get all three of these shows delivered to your phone by subscribing on Apple, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, whatever your favorite podcasting app is. We encourage you, please subscribe. And also, if you're a veteran listener of this show, if you've been listening for a long time, if you love it, share it, please. Help us to grow this show. Listening is great. We love that you're listening. And with new listeners, welcome. Thank you for listening. But we need to grow this show, guys. This is so important. The topics we talk about on Felony Friday and on the other two shows are, let's just say they are not abundant out there in the podcasting sphere. There's a good amount of libertarian shows. There is no other libertarian variety show like this one we have here. That is why Lions of Liberty is so important, I think. We're able to bring in people who are passionate about, who are interested in, who want to see criminal justice reform from the left, the right, the center, from all over the political arena. And maybe they come to listen to the Felony Friday and they stick around and they listen to our Monday show with Mark Clare and Electric Liberty Liberty Land with Brian McWilliams. We have the same thing happen with Brian's show and Mark's show. People come in, listen to their shows, then they find Felony Friday. That is the... Greatest thing about having this format that we have here at Lions of Liberty. There's something for everybody. So please share the show and help us to grow this podcast. My guest today, I'm really excited about you guys getting to know him. He's a friend of mine. He uh, lives here in Pennsylvania as well. I've gotten to know him while I've been helping Dale Kearns campaign for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania. So let's get started with today's show. My guest today on Felony Friday is Chris Dreisbach. Chris is the CEO of Blueprints for Addiction Recovery. He is also a felon. Uh, He spent uh, just over two years in prison. And since then, he's obviously gotten out of prison and he's now a successful entrepreneur. Chris, welcome to Felony Friday. Thanks for having me on Felony Friday. Every Friday is Felony Friday for me. I like that. I, I like that attitude. That's a uh, that's that's a good way to uh, to go through life. But um, or not. Well, I mean, it's good to have that attitude. That attitude about it. But thanks for coming on the show. And uh, for the listeners out there, or people uh, watching on YouTube, uh, you and I know each other through uh, through Dale Kearns. I am Dale's campaign manager. People, most people know that. And you've been uh, organizing a. Uh, I guess a town hall tour, a uh, an outreach tour with your uh, with your nonprofit Blueprints for Addiction Recovery. So maybe we'll start there and just kind of jump around. Um, you're the CEO of Blueprints for Addiction Recovery. How long ago did you found that? What's the the mission behind it? So Blueprints was founded in February of 2016, and the whole mission behind Blueprints was because we saw so many people leave inpatient treatment and not follow up with recommended aftercare and then relapse and fall into this vicious cycle of relapse over and over and over and over again. And we wanted to make sure we could flesh out and develop a program that would engage people in such a way that it would keep them in aftercare 
all the way through to lifelong sobriety. So we did that. We started that in February 2016. Uh, and earlier this year in 2018, we launched out on this town hall tour that we called Breaking the Cycle, mm -hmm. uh, Communities Against Addiction. Because obviously we want to break the cycle of addiction as it is a harmful, deadly, deadly cycle. Absolutely. Um, so you talk about getting people into aftercare. What is the, uh, what's the strategy? What's the key to, to being able to do that? So traditionally, somebody will start with a, a detox, which is either between five and 14 days, depending on the substance and depending on the person. So after that detox, a lot of people have this antiquated mindset that once you're physically detoxed, you're better and you're okay and you're ready to resume life just like everybody else. So some people will be able to go, and depending on insurance and many other complicated things, will be able to go to a 28-day inpatient residential facility, which we also now have um, one of those. Um, once you're done with that, you'll then, if you follow the continuum of care the way it's developed, you'll go to a four-week partial hospitalization program, which consists of five hours of therapy, five to seven days a week. Okay. Then you'll step down to an intensive outpatient, which is three hours a day, three days a week. And then you can step down into a generalized outpatient, which is one hour a day, one day a week with some individuals if necessary. So it's essential for somebody suffering from substance use disorder to follow the entire continuum. And what will happen is a lot of places will hyper focus on one or the other. Mm -hmm. but nobody really talks about the entire continuum and making sure that everybody follows that path so that they can maintain lifelong sobriety like I've been able to thus far. Yeah, so let's talk about your story a little bit. Um, sure. You spent about two years uh, in prison, right? So what uh, what what got you in that situation? What what sent you down that path? So I was introduced to alcohol when I was 13 years old in 1999. You know, all the way back in the 19s and 1900s. So old, John. <laughs> and you know, uh, through. Alcohol, I got introduced to plenty of other things, you know, some pharmaceuticals, some psychedelics, some just all manner of things that kind of made me okay with me for periods of time. And after a while, when I was about 18, I got introduced to heroin. And heroin kind of took me to the ends of the earth. Heroin took me places I definitely never wanted to go. It became my only focus, my primary goal to obtain heroin literally every minute of every day and feel okay. And it got to this point where I couldn't do anything without heroin at all, you know, and unfortunately, in order to obtain heroin, I needed to obtain money. And it led me to doing some less than reputable things, uh, if you will. And one of those less than reputable things was walking into other people's houses and taking their belongings. And it might shock you, but in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, that's totally illegal. I see your shocking, yeah. your shocked face right now. Very shocking. Um, and I actually, on I checked this up earlier, March 30th of 2006, I walked into someone's house, I took one hypodermic needle, and I walked out of their house. And then I was charged minutes later with three felonies. So what were the three felonies? Burglary, criminal trespass, and conspiracy to commit burglary. So what what happened then? Obviously, you're arrested. You're in jail. Was that uh, how long did you spend in prison during that stretch and during that stretch? So what was the? I mean, did you go through detox? What, what was that like? Oh yes, oh yes. I detoxed for the first time in jail. It was a uh, pretty horrendous. I don't remember that one specifically. Uh, it was a pretty long time ago. Uh, there were some detoxes in jail in the future I can tell you about, and those were pretty tragic. But the first time, I don't remember a whole heck of a lot about it other than, you know, being locked in a cage for the first time and staring out of the window, looking at the bail bonds placed across the street, wishing that somebody would fork over thirty-five or $50,000 to bail me out. And uh, I sat there for probably 95 days until my grandmother actually did come and bail me out and put her house up on the line for me. And... Uh, I got out and I maintained sobriety for about zero seconds because I had zero treatment in jail. I just had a nice uh, locked door. And, you know, unfortunately, I had this thing called a bail officer who then became a parole officer. And that led me into my second stop in jail, mm -hmm. um, at which point I was there for several months. I can't tell you with certainty how many days because 
they all kind of start to blend together at this point. Um, once I got out again, uh, shockingly enough, the same thing happened. I had zero treatment. I was still a raging drug addict. I was just very dry for a period of time. And I got out and I relapsed right away. I still had a thing called a PO. And that PO was not too kind uh, when it came to me consuming heroin, which was the only thing I knew how to do, the only thing I was equipped to do. Uh, and I ended up running away to North Carolina because I didn't want to go back to jail. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to stop using substances. So I had to make a decision to either run or stay. And I went to North Carolina and I got arrested in North Carolina. Why, and they told why me North to Carolina? Was that just a, just a random thing? or I, I had a friend in North Carolina and I just wanted to get away from, from Allentown and Lehigh County in general. And I ran to North Carolina. I got arrested for some dangerous crime, like driving without a seatbelt or something like that. And they told me to <laughs> told me to get my butt out of North Carolina. So I turned tail and I ran to Buffalo, New York, because that's what real logical smart people do when they're running from parole. Right, right from uh, North Carolina to Buffalo. That's a that's a common common yes. trip, I think. Yeah. It's an exact common trip, and you know, uh, I got arrested in Buffalo, New York, a very cold, cold place. Everyone in Buffalo wears 1991 championship shirts and sweatshirts because they're still holding on to the glory days of the Buffalo Bills. Still today they do. Yeah. I'm sure they do still, but everybody in jail, that's what I remember. All mid, all middle-aged guys wearing 91 Bills jerseys. So you're, you're in Buffalo, you're, you're sitting in jail. Um, you're, I, I assume at this point you're detoxing as well. Severe detox. It so was what, unbelievable. Yeah. What was, what was that experience like? So in Buffalo, the jails, at least in 2006, were extremely overcrowded. Uh, so I was in an intake block that wasn't much of an intake block. In fact, it was just a gym, a gymnasium uh, with little boats on the floor. And there were about 140 people in that room with me, probably 139 of them detoxing. There was one sink, one toilet, uh, zero showers. For four days, we were all throwing up on ourselves and, and peeing ourselves and defecating ourselves. and uh, there's nowhere to shower. It was it was pretty gross. It was very unpleasant. And you would think that that would be a sufficient motivator uh, to get me on the right path. But unfortunately, without treatment of an illness, which is substance use disorder, <laughs> that's not sufficient. And again, uh, I spent near 11 months in jail at that point uh, between Buffalo and Allentown where they shipped me back. And I got, again, zero real treatment. And when I got out, Here's the shocker. I relapsed right away. And I started the train of circumstances for 60 days that were just an absolute nightmare for me until I got arrested again. Let, let, me, let, me, let me back you up. Let me back up for just, for just a minute because um, I just want you to clarify this and explain it. So you keep saying you got zero re real treatment. So yes. were they giving some type of you know treatment in, in jail? Was there something that they, they were saying, yeah, he's been treated and stamped the well, paper? Or let me, let me quote with you on treatment because it, uh, I think in, in Lehigh County, and God bless them because I'm sure they tried as best they could to help uh, in their own way, uh, but the treatment was through a place uh, that I won't name, but it came in and it was a, a one class for one hour, maybe three weeks in a row for three days a week with a guy who was very kind, but he also gave me no skills and no tools and nothing to use when I left jail. Mm -hmm. So he was probably a very well-intentioned, great man. He just didn't give me any skills. I did get a nice certificate that said I had completed some kind of something. Mm -hmm. uh, but in reality, it gave me zero skills. So it's a nice thing probably to prop up and say, hey, I put this program in this jail. But in reality, it, it did nothing. Just got us out of our cells for a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because uh, my guest last week, Randy Kearse, He's written books and uh, he's trying to help with, uh, he's out of Brooklyn, New York, trying to help with the re reintegration, uh, uh, you know, getting people from prison back into society, being, you know, get, give them a taste of success, give them the skills you know, to actually come out and hit the ground running. And he's having trouble getting his program into these prisons because they tell him, well, we only use evidence-based um, programs. They got to be evidence-based. <laughs> and we, we had a laugh about it because, well, all these programs I have right now, they have a lot of evidence that none of them freaking work. But <laughs> I mean, maybe that's the evidence they want because they make money keeping us in the cage. 
That's possible. That's very possible. I'm going to go with yes. Yeah. Very possible. My name is Dale Kearns, and I'm running for United States Senate in Pennsylvania as a libertarian. I'm a concerned citizen who has had enough. I work as a project manager for an electrical contractor in southeastern Pennsylvania. There I manage large commercial and industrial projects. I'm a husband and a father of two energetic little girls. I'm running to advocate for a society where my girls have more liberty, not less. Will you support our campaign? Unlike my competitors, I'm not a career politician. I don't have millionaire and billionaire donors. I'm running for Senate in Pennsylvania because I want to take the message to Washington that we want government out of our lives. Will you let me be your voice? Let me be the voice that says, we will not walk quietly down the road to serfdom. The voice that says, we need free market solutions. The voice that says, we need to end the failed war on drugs. The voice who will fight for the forgotten man, non-violent offenders wasting away in prison, and addicts who are afraid to speak up and seek the help they need. We are seeking members for our campaign team. I encourage you to apply. We need donations to help us spread the message of liberty across the state. We can go on hoping for liberty to happen, or we can fight together. I hope you choose the latter and join me today. Find out more at DaleKearns.com. Paid for by Dale Kearns for Office. So let's uh, let's continue on there. Sorry to interrupt you there, but from okay, good soapbox. From, <laughs> from Buffalo, um, uh, what, what was the next uh, the next stop? So from Buffalo, I was there for ten days until they took me in front of the New York State Supreme Court to verify that I was who I was, so they could ship me back to Allentown. And they shipped me back to Allentown, where I got to see the same judge I saw now three times before, and he was thankfully a very progressive judge for the time in two thousand seven or 2006, one of those years, can't even tell you anymore. Uh, and he he said, after your time is up, I'm gonna send you to treatment. I'm gonna send you to drug and alcohol rehab. And I thought to myself, great, you know, get me out of jail, who cares? Uh, so after a good 11 months, you know, or whenever, however long it was, he mm-hmm. sent me to this rehab. And this rehab was all about behavior modification because what's wrong with me is clearly my behavior because I ran away, I'm a bad kid, you know? Uh, it's not it's not what's wrong with me i have a legitimate illness that needs to be treated it's not a behavior modification issue and unfortunately that judge who was great well-meaning uh very progressive for the time just sent me to the wrong place for treatment so again he tried Mm -hmm. but it wasn't the right thing so when i got out of there might shock you but i relapsed again right away (laughs) And that was when it started that two month course where my life was an absolute disaster and I had no hope on the horizon and no, no anything really that I could look forward to. I was 20 years old and my entire life consisted of just trying to exist, just trying to get through another day, just trying to not go to jail, just trying not to disappoint my family to the point where, uh, you know, it, it impacted their lives too badly, even though it did everything that I did impacted them negatively. And finally, on August 27th of 2007, I got arrested for the final time by the Allentown Vice Squad for walking in an area I shouldn't have walked in and having a needle in my pocket. So I'm a dangerous criminal. I'm a rough felon. I have a lot of needles, needle charges. All these these violent crimes. Wait, wait, none of them. None of them were violent. (laughs) I mean, admittedly, I shouldn't have walked into that lady's house the first time. It was kind of breaking and entering. Yeah, that's that's fine. I didn't break. I opened the door. It was unlocked, but still, yeah. you know, I, I take that one. I don't know that I should be branded with a little F next to my name for the rest of my life for it, but I've turned it into something at this point. Yeah, you certainly yeah. have. So what what was the, I mean, what was the turning point for you? I'm assuming you found some treatment that worked. That's the toughest question because after I got to see that judge again, after I got arrested for having that needle and, you know, multiple parole violations because they all come with it all the time. And um, he said, I'm going to send you to treatment again when your time's done. You know, you're 20 years old. I don't want to see you like the very progressive judge. Great man. Still on the bench in Allentown right now. Um, judge Steinberg, you ever hear this? Keep being progressive, you know? Sure he's on uh, Twitter. Well, I'll, I'll tweet it to him. Judge tweet Steinberg. him. Yeah. I don't know if he's on Twitter. <laughs> it should be. I'm not even really on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, he sent me to treatment again, and uh, this time it was a a drug and alcohol rehab, more the way it's supposed to be, a place I went on to actually work at for a period of time, a place I still go to to bring meetings and and inject hope into people and try and help them out, a place called Bowling Green in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. And while there, 
I don't know that there was any great white light experience that happened, but from there, they shipped me to a halfway house, a place that I could continue my treatment and continue to get better and continue to learn how to live on the outside. And while nothing great white light happened because of that halfway house, it did allow me to get in touch with some people that showed me a different way to live. And I have not given that up for the last 11 years, and thankfully so, because I've been able to create a pretty decent life. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that because you are you're you're an entrepreneur. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of felons have a hard time finding work. A lot of it's hard to find a job. It's hard to find housing. Yes. How did you overcome that? Start your own business. Um, what, what what do you attribute that to? I mean, that's that's tough because I I attribute it to providence. It just kind of occurred for me in such an organic way. Uh, that I just went along for the ride and, and busted my butt to stay with it. And, uh, you know, I, I got out of uh, the rehab. I went to the halfway house. I worked at a diner, you know, I was waiting tables. Uh, the diner, local diner in Lancaster gave me a chance. Uh, even though I had absolutely nothing, I think the manager who hired me had to give me a loan so I could go get pants and shoes. Uh, she was extremely progressive as well, you know, and I worked there for a couple of years and I busted my butt 70 hours a week and Eventually, I opened my first business, which was just providing housing to other people coming out of treatment. And it turned into a 14-house, 140-bed, uh, amazing, amazing company that took me places I never expected I'd go. And, uh, you know, in the middle there, I met some great guys, and we opened a construction company. And in the middle, I uh, met some great guys, and we opened a landscaping company. And in the middle of that met some great guys and we opened a marketing company and an IT company. And in the middle of that, I can't even tell you all the other things I've gotten to do just because they're so, they're so numerous and organic and just finding people, most of them felons, shockingly enough, some of the most compelling and interesting people. That's, that's so incredible. So how many, do you you still have most of those businesses or what's your primary business now? I've handed over the housing specifically to a guy who went through the program, actually, who is not a felon, but he is running that now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I divested out of most of the other ones so that I don't have much of a day-to-day operational thing so that I can focus mostly on blueprints and real estate because I have my real estate license, okay. which is strange enough that you would think that a you know felony trespass and things like that would block you from having things like that. But if you put in the effort and you put in the work, I don't think there's anything that you can't accomplish. Well, that's good. I, I don't know if that's true in every state with being able to be Not a felon. Every state. <laughs> but uh, actually, Pennsylvania, uh, this could be a lot more progress made, but from at least at least in Pennsylvania, felons can vote, right? Yes. Don't have uh, Second Amendment rights, which is ridiculous. Yeah, this, I mean, obviously, still, still dealing with the stigma, but mm-hmm. I mean, that's why I love what you're doing. You are... Uh, directly impacting dealing with that stigma stigma by hiring felons. So yes, we have, hopefully you'll meet them viewers of this show. Hopefully you'll meet several of my employees and hopefully you'll meet several of my business partners coming up in the next weeks. Cause uh, John seems to want to talk to most of them. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, definitely love to have them on the show and get their stories. Cause uh, I mean, every story is important. Every story is different. And I think that people can learn, uh, learn from Absolutely. these stories. So for a l- little background, on what you do with blueprints from what I've seen from the, uh, what's the name? Breaking the cycle. I keep, I keep yes. forgetting that because Dale has, Dale Kearns has addiction is not a crime. And yeah. He stole it from us. He's just stealing a- it. Yeah. <laughs> so the first one I went to was up in Johnstown. I think that was yeah. the first time I met you and Dale was speaking. Um, the doctor, I forget the name of the doctor. Um, Dr. Frank, Dr. Yep. Frank. Yeah. I love Dr. Frank and X-Pac from, uh, yes. the, Famous uh, uh, professional wrestler, X-Pac. Yep. And I, I thought it was just, just so incredible, such a unique and powerful idea to have these different people from different walks of life, totally crazy different experiences. Dr. Frank bringing you the, the medical perspective of it. X-Pac bringing you um, his story of addiction. Um, this is powerful that, that w- when he shares that. And yeah. uh, just so... Uh, I guess he's only done that a handful of times. Uh, for Three. Four, that was his first time. And yeah. that was very impressive. Yeah. And uh, it's great. It was so great to see people in the community uh, coming out and 
you know, people themselves, I guess some people they're seeking treatment themselves or looking for support for loved ones who, who are going through uh, addiction um, and dealing with that themselves. In, in your role in it, um, you sort of act as the MC. And I think people watching this and listening to this have heard that you kind of, it's, it's kind of, you're going from very serious topic to serious topic. And when Dale Kearns does his talk, it's very emotional. He's talking about family members who have suffered and, and passed away. And uh, you have this unique talent to be able to come in and insert just a little bit of humor in between. I, I think, I mean, that's, that's necessary, but it's, uh, I just, just want to tell you that that's, a, it's, a, it's just a great sort of transition between the, the way you handle that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I almost have to make light of things because there's so much tragedy surrounding drug addiction. There's so much tragedy surrounding all of the things that, that I get to see on a daily basis that without that little bit of humor to help people remember that we're all human and help people remember that we can all recover. We can all be okay. Even people who don't struggle with drug addiction. I mean, if you inject a little bit of love into your lives, you too can be okay and enjoy life. So I'd like to add a little bit of humor, just a little. <laughs> so how many, how many events have you had for the breaking the cycle? So we had 17 thus far, uh, just Tuesday night. A couple nights ago, we were in Delaware County, uh, mm -hmm. Dale's hometown, or close to his hometown, somewhere in that county. We did our 17th one. Um, we've met, I'm going to go with thousands, thousands of Pennsylvanians who've just been impacted by addiction and who are tired of that stigma, who are tired of being criminalized, who are tired of all those things that hold drug addicts and alcoholics and people who suffer from substance use disorder down. And it's been inspiring to go across this entire state and, you know, meet regionally with people who all feel the same way and who all want this to end and want to stop losing our loved ones and losing our friends and losing our families and, and really just even losing people we don't know. We're just tired of death and we're tired of pain and we're tired of suffering and it, we're, we're here to change it. Yeah. It, I mean, most of the people that I'm obviously there, you know, representing Dale um, and mm -hmm. I get to talk to a lot of people and most of them, I, they probably don't even identify with any political party, um, which is, which is fine. I, I didn't really care. Yeah. I, I really didn't used to either. But when you start telling them about libertarian ideas, libertarian principles, how, you know, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, as long as you're not stealing their property or harming someone, there's no reason to, to lock someone in a cage for, uh, for making a mistake, for being addicted to a substance or for selling a plant or something like that. And it's, it's amazing how many people just really haven't thought about it that way. But when the, just that, when you bring that up, they're like, wow, that's, that's incredible. And so many people have said, I'm going to vote for Dale Kearns. And they'd never heard of him until that event. So it's a, yeah. it's a powerful thing. And I want to ask you, because I'm not sure exactly when you became a libertarian, but I think you uh, would call yourself a libertarian now, correct me if I'm wrong, but can you tell us a little bit about that, that sure. transition, what, how that happened? So in, in 2002, when I was 16, uh, I actually stumbled across Ken Krawchuk uh, running for governor because I was beginning to get a little bit politically active, not really understanding too much about life at 16 and mostly focusing on alcohol and things that I could do to make myself feel good. Uh, I ran across Ken Krawchuk and some of his ideals and they, they mirrored the way that I was thinking. I don't know if that's good or bad at that point, but they mirrored some of the ways that I thought mm -hmm. logic should be. And I actually sent an email. I don't know how popular email even was in 2002, but I sent Ken an email. I'm surprised Ken had email. email back then, really. He saved it, he said. Uh, so I sent him an email, and he took time to respond back to me and talk to me about his thoughts and his ideas and uh, just the fact that I was 16 and I couldn't even vote for him in that election. Um, he took plenty of time to have a phone call with me and explain wow. to me his ideals and explain to me what was going on. And that spoke volumes because I also emailed Ed Rendell and Mike Fisher and neither of those guys had the decency, I guess, to, to email a 16 year old kid who was curious about politics back. And I think just, just that alone, that human connection, and that compassion that Ken showed me at that time uh, led me to look deeper into libertarian principles, which I then realized were extremely logical, very rational, and made sense. So that's how that happened. <laughs> that's, inc that's incredible. I had no idea that, that, uh, 
that was the uh, that was the story that you that you messaged sure. Ken. And for the people listening, um, Ken is running for governor again in, in Pennsylvania. So okay. um, I think he's. I don't know how many times this is, but this will be his most successful time. I'm sure of that he he will do uh, he will do well. So uh, check out Ken Ken Krawchuk or what is it Ken K for PA? I think is the website. That might be wrong. I'll link to it on the show notes page. But uh, Ken's a good guy. Yeah. So talking about uh, libertarian ideals, obviously libertarians are against the war on drugs. And there's something that you've done recently. You gave me a call a couple of weeks ago and uh, I was excited to hear this. You had met with a couple local sheriffs in your, uh, in your county and they were open to a little decriminalization of drugs in order to allow people to, to seek treatment. Right. So yeah. can you, share how that came about. And I don't know how much information that, that you can give on that or if, if it's publicly. Uh... So we're, we're in the midst of fleshing out a program again. Uh, we like to be bold and uh, create programs that go above and beyond what other people have done. Uh, so in Pennsylvania, there's actually two, I don't know if they're boroughs, municipalities or what there are, but they've created a safe haven as a part of their police station. So if you're a person who's struggling with substance use disorder, you can go to the police station, hand them your needle and say, hey, I'd like to get help. I'd like treatment. And they'll take that needle, put it in a basket and help you get it into treatment. Not arrest you. Like I was arrested multiple times for possessing a hypodermic instrument that you can now buy at CVS. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they took this little idea of decriminalizing. I don't know what their real intent was, but tremendous program. Ben Salem and another place up near Bethlehem in Pennsylvania are the two places who've done that. So we have been working with an extremely progressive police chief here in Elizabethtown where our headquarters for blueprints are and the Northwest Regional Police, which is right by uh, Elizabethtown, actually kind of surrounds it. And both of those police chiefs are tired of watching their people die. And we came up with this idea where we're going to work hand in hand with them to provide access to treatment for every single person that goes to their police station and asks for help. They're going to be able to go there, hand in whatever they want to hand in, not be prosecuted or harassed about those things and get access to treatment directly. Something else we're working on is hiring a certified recovery specialist to respond to all overdose and drug related calls with those police officers so that there is no gap in time between their overdose and treatment. So it's just an immediate fire handoff instead of a warm handoff like the programs Governor Wolf has been trying to implement. We're going to go with a fire handoff because warm handoffs just aren't fast enough. What what is Governor Wolf trying to implement then? I'm not sure if he's even trying to implement it or not, but uh, there's this new thing called a warm handoff where they'll call somebody into a hospital after an overdose. But the problem with that is a lot of people don't even make it to the hospital from an overdose. Some people will refuse treatment. Some people will refuse to take the ambulance ride because it costs 600 bucks to ride an ambulance. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's a lot of people that get missed. So if you have somebody who is willing to respond to the overdose with the officers, with the first responders, we're hopefully going to be able to curb some of the epidemic and some of the deaths as a result of having somebody who's certified in intervention there with them right away. So have these couple police chiefs been open to, um, if they're arresting someone, you know, say someone doesn't come to them and, and hand over their needle, hand over their drugs, what if they, are they going to sort of at least lower the prioritization of pursuing the war on drugs? Or has that been talked about at all? It's been talked about. It's been brought up. And unfortunately, they have many bosses, uh, many higher ups. And not all of those people are progressive uh, like they are. Not all of those people have the same ideas to how to curb this epidemic as we do. So there's a lot more convincing and a lot more red tape that's going to need to take place for that to happen. But it's a utopian idea, John. I'm really, I'm pushing for it. Yeah. I mean, I I don't think, I think even a year ago, I was less hopeful that it was going to happen relatively soon. When I say relatively soon, talking the next five to 10 years. But I I think the, the one thing that needs to fall is it's going to be marijuana first that becomes decriminalized nationwide. And I think that could happen pretty quickly here. Um, with the election coming up, I could see Trump doing something, just trying to get out in front of the Democrats and starting to push that. Could happen, might not, who knows. But with the rest of it, I mean, just a few years ago, if you mentioned 
um, legalizing heroin, legalizing cocaine as a public safety issue, you know, in order to curb this, uh, this epidemic that we have, this crisis that we have people, people dying, um, people would, you know, just get angry at you and say, that's not going to work. It's just going to make it worse. But now you'll say that and people say, you know what, that, that, that makes sense. It makes sense that you don't want people, you know, taking their drugs in, a, in an alleyway or a CD hotel. I mean, it would make sense that they could actually, you know, go get their drugs tested or uh, actually know what's in them, not have that stuff on the black market. So I think we're making progress there. Do you, do you agree with that? Uh, and regionally, regionally, again, uh, you know, people are, you come over to Lancaster County and say that, you're going to get the same, are you crazy? Really? Uh, you know, look, because this is a very conservative county. This is a county that's pretty, forgive me for saying it, Lancaster, but behind the times and not really progressive in thought when it comes to those things. But if you go down to Philadelphia, where it's fairly clear that laws don't work in regards to that, a lot more people are going to be willing to listen to that because they gather that whether it's legal or not, there's still going to be a disastrous amount of people suffering on the streets right by them. Here in the farmland, they might not see that every day. So they're not going to be as open to the idea because they may still believe that silly antiquated laws from tons of years ago are going to actually stop somebody from doing something. Right. Yeah, I so, think that's important. Yes no. We are making progress, but no. <laughs> yeah. If if people don't if people if people don't see it, if they can ignore it, then they assume it's working. If it's you know, if it's if it's working for them, if there's not, you know, somebody uh impacting their life in some way, then uh, they assume it's working. But it, in Pennsylvania, I think Pennsylvania has one of the highest rates of uh overdose during this opioid crisis. I'm not sure exactly the numbers, but I think the third worst. I mean, al- almost everyone is, is impacted in some way, be it a family member or a friend. Um, I, I don't know how somebody could be living in Pennsylvania and not, not, not be impacted by this in some way, but we're making progress. Thanks to, uh, thanks to people like you who are uh, really dedicating your life to this, which, uh, which is incredible. And I just want to give you the opportunity, Chris, to, share for my listeners and people watching where they can learn more about blueprints, where they can learn more about anything else you're working on and any other advice or, or things you want to, you want to speak on. Yeah. I mean, if anybody listening uh, knows somebody who's struggling with substance use disorder, knows somebody who might have a tendency to struggle with it, knows somebody whose life might even be remotely impacted by it and just wants to learn some more about events that are going on in your local area you could call directly into our 24-hour admissions line and talk to our admissions staff at 717-361-1660. Again, 717-361-1660. Or you can visit us on the old interwebs that John loves so much at www.blueprintsrecovery.com. And again, that's blueprintsrecovery.com. And, you know, just uh, keep spreading the word. Keep spreading the word and fighting the fight against that stigma that tells people that people who suffer from substance use disorder are bad and that it's a moral failing and that it is some kind of behavioral issue because none of those things are true. Those thoughts are so antiquated that it's unbelievable that people still believe them. Mm -hmm. And the reality of the situation is that there aren't too many people in the world that would say I'm a bad guy anymore. There's a few, there's a few, my ex-wife, for example, but, uh, Reality is, you know, once you recover from substance use disorder, you can resume a vital place in the role of the community and a vital role in everywhere, in your family's life, your friend's life, uh, uh, economically. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even know. I probably have 75 employees at this point, something like that. It's not a, a massive number, but that's 75 people, 75 families that kind of rely on the things that we were able to create and don't ever let a little felony, don't ever let a little misdemeanor, don't ever let a little anything block you from your dreams and block you from the things that you can do because the world is wide open, even though there are little blockades set in our place. That's awesome, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode with Chris Dreisbach. Um, Really, really powerful story. And Chris, I mean, Chris has a great sense of humor. He's great at uh, really 
taken you through each stage of his story. And I think he really, you know, I don't know if he gave himself, if he gives himself enough credit for, for what he's done. But what a testament, uh, just the life that he's living for, for what, he's, what he's overcome, um, the, the addiction, uh, the illness that he's, uh, that he's suffered from, and, and he's overcome. So the number of businesses that he started, uh, the amount of uh, recovering addicts, uh, felons who were employed by him, who are now business owners, uh, that's, that's just incredible. Uh, you just look at the cumulative effect and it's like the you know when you throw a throw a stone in a in a pond in some water and you see the ripple effect and that is that is Chris's life the the ripple effect. So anyone out there who is struggling with addiction, who has made a mistake, who's screwed up, who's committed a crime, who's stolen someone's property, who's harmed someone, you can overcome it. You can come back. Doesn't matter how bad it is. We're all humans. We all make mistakes. It's having the ability, it's having the um, stick to and the stubbornness to succeed. And Chris has done that. And it's, I think he has a great story. And I was really happy that he was willing to come on the show and share that. And I'm excited for you guys, for the Felony Friday listeners, to hear uh, from Chris's uh, colleagues, from his employees. Uh, down the road here on Felony Friday as they come on and they share their story, share what they've suffered through and how they've come out on the other side and found success. So that's going to be really exciting. And just to be totally honest right now, this is the outro, and this is the only thing standing between this guy right here, between me, if you're not watching the video, this is available on YouTube, this guy right here pointing to myself and my vacation. So I actually, by the time you listen to this, I'll almost done with vacation. But anyway, that's not important because as I'm recording this, it is before vacation. And I I love vacation. I love to relax. I love going to the beach. I love uh, seeing my family. So it's going to be a great week. And just want to say one more thing. Everyone listening out there, I ask you at the beginning to share this show. People who've listened for a while, veteran listeners. Uh, new listeners, it's cool if you share it. We, we like that. But just listen, listen to some old episodes, make sure to get a sense of what we're all about, you know, check out some older episodes of Felony Friday. Episode 100 uh, is, is a great episode that was a, a roundtable discussion with three former cops, a progressive, a conservative, and a libertarian. Awesome episode if you're looking to go back in the Felony Friday archives. Tons of episodes, great um, stories from felons who've had similar lives, similar success stories to uh, the one Chris shared today. So check those out. But if you like this show and you really want to help us grow it, the best way to do that is to become a patron, to become a Patreon. Um, and you can do that by going to Lion... No, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty and signing up for as little as five bucks a month. You get all our bonus content. And uh, there's more levels than that. I won't go into them. You can read all about it at patreon.com slash lines of liberty with that being said that's all i got for today thank you all so much for listening uh this is john odermatt signing off always remember to keep your head up and the fires of liberty burning <laughs>